So we um, have been doing some work to try with the administration to try to get a presentation about the transition um, pieces, childcare and uh, all of that. And we've been going back and I've been going back and forth and me and Brian with Kendall and Tate Brooks um, and to try to settle on a time. I'm pushing for a time on Tuesday. Um, they've said Thursday. I pushed back this morning. By the end of today, I should have a time. So we would do something. Hopefully we can do something with the administration with all their different pieces to get a full presentation, and we would invite the whole Senate to participate in that if um, if we can get that put together. So one of the things that we would talk about Monday morning as a side to our list, because um, I we're gonna, I encourage you all to work on the list over the weekend is that, um, that we'll talk about what are the pieces in that presentation from the administration, we'll have a good idea of what they plan on doing. And if there's holes in that, um, we'll want to talk about that and make a request that they're able to um, pull together better information. So, um, you know, we'll get the money stuff from Jane today and then the administration, hopefully early next week. Sounds good. So Jane, mm -hmm. I don't see um, the other members. Do you want to start, Brian? Or yeah, sure. So uh, as folks know, uh, we've asked Senator Kitchell to come in to talk to us and give us a sense of fiscal realities as we take a look at these transition costs that the pro tem asked us to um, to do. So as we've received these lists from uh, committee chairs, you know, we all, I think, have noticed the lists have been long. They've been extensive. Um, I know we're all hearing from constituents as well that, and advocates, uh, that they are concerned with a range of things as we transition back to some level of equilibrium in the state. So we asked Senator Kitchell to give us just a, a sense of you know, dollars and in, in the reality of what we may and may not be able to do. So uh, with that, um, I will turn it over, unless Rich, Senator Westman wants to mention anything else, I'll send, turn it over to Senator Kitchell. Thank you, Jane. Thanks oh. for being here. Well, thanks uh, for asking me. What a way to start the day with uh, money. Um, so there's good news and there is bad news. Um, the bad news is our general fund revenue situation is extremely serious. I, I don't think we can impress on people enough uh, that uh, the revenue impact for the last quarter of this fiscal year and in 21 um, is very significant. Uh, in the last quarter of this year, we're putting together the budget adjustment now, and that's that's not too difficult. Um, but uh, the right now, the estimates for revenue um, reductions uh, from Tom Cavett is a total of $430 million. So, um, when you look at that, it, there's uh, the major uh, pieces uh, would be um, the uh, uh, general fund, which is 266 million down, transportation 52, and education uh, uh, one, 113 million. <clears throat> and so uh, Ways and Means has been working uh, diligently to think of how to um, mitigate that loss because the revenue stream into the state ed fund have, uh, are greatly impacted. And because there's sales, sales tax, all the sales tax now goes in 25% um, of uh, rooms and meals. So if you look at the hospitality and um, that area of uh, economic sector, it's really um, been hammered and um, purchase and use, a third of the purchase and use on cars uh, goes in as well. All the lottery goes in. So people think that it's only uh, property taxes, but it, there are significant other revenues, but those revenues um, have, um, have really uh, experienced significant decline, both in terms of those that flow into the Ed Fund and those that flow into the general fund. So if anyone is thinking about how we can use more general fund, 
we need to figure out how do we close a gap of $266 million. Um, so that is just the fiscal reality at, on the state level. The, uh, that, that obviously is not good news. The bad, um, so I'll go to the good news, but it, it's tinged. And that is, we know that we have the 1.25 billion um, Corona Relief Fund grant. Um, but um, that grant, in fact, cannot be used to help us with those revenue losses. It's got to be with costs. So um, to get relief uh, on, that, um, on the revenue side, uh, we're hoping that maybe um, uh, Congress will take further action and provide some uh, additional uh, financial relief that doesn't come with these strings. And this is not just the state level. You're going to be hearing from towns and municipalities, and their big thing is because they're experiencing um, a revenue impact. Sometimes it's uh, property taxes that people won't be able to pay. But um, well, Brian, down in your area, I don't know, Rich, in your area, certainly in Burlington, any uh, particularly resort towns, they have local option taxes. And you look at what they are, rooms and meals and sales. So some of these municipalities are going to not only um, uh, have maybe higher costs, but also are gonna be experiencing um, a real impact on revenues simply because of that local option revenue stream that's gonna be greatly impacted. So to me, our challenge is how we take the 1.25 and use it in the most strategic way we can, ways we can. We know that we have um, short-term um, emergency needs and the Joint Fiscal Committee, and if you haven't seen it, um, I'm, I'm sure it's been sent out, um, lays out how we have authorized um, almost 170 million of that 1.2. And a lot of it is um, certainly in the healthcare arena uh, for healthcare providers, but certainly childcare, public health, setting up uh, emergency operation system and the list goes on. So I wanna uh, let you know that if you haven't seen it, it'll give you some sense. In addition, we already have authorized the essential worker bill, which would appropriate another 60 million uh, for uh, those grants that would go out under that um, program, which is still in the house at this point. In the budget adjustment, we're also taking some of that Corona relief money um, into uh, an area that we already have had a lot of discussion about, and that's the state college system um, and the University of Vermont. They both are having to refund room and board. So the uh, budget adjustment uses some of the Corona relief money to address those associated costs. We also know that we're gonna have costs with the legislature. Um, we're gonna be meeting longer than normal. And so we're, there is um, uh, 750,000 to how we can support our work as we uh, deal with so many unknowns out into the future. And then um, another area, and this gets into certainly, I view it as transition planning, and that is the judiciary, 4.9 million and because they recognize the way in which uh, they serve the public, they've got to modify how to make jury trials safe, for example. And the other part is um, just like uh, anticipating the surge in healthcare, um, there's, there's gonna be a big surge because there's a backlog of cases because the court's been shut down. And so how do they accommodate that workload and what strategies they have to start up? And so there'll be money for uh, judiciary um, and the courts, but also with the associated um, uh, uh, other systems, including um, state's attorneys and the defender general. And, um, I'm, and I believe that there's gonna be a request in there for um, domestic violence um, services. So that just gives you some sense of out of that 1.2, but that leaves, um, uh, you know, a significant amount of funding. One of the challenges, and I think, you know, you're gonna be looking at this, and that is so much of what we're getting is coming down ad hoc. Every group is saying, give me 10 million, give me 15 and I, you know, I deserve it and I'll do great things. I don't mean to minimize it, but I think it gets back to Tim's concern. And that is, we need to be um, thinking about um, systems in a, in a broader way than just, you know, this particular piece. 
Um, and oftentimes uh, it's very easy when you've got people that are very well organized or they've got advocacy or they've got you know paid lobbyists, but that um, but we can't forget um, that that may not that there may be really important parts uh, that we need to address and think about in a systems way. And um, to me, one of the parallels that we can take some experience with, and that's the essential worker program. Now, some workers had people there lobbying, and they've gotten money. The state police have, you know, state some state employees, the DAs, yeah, but who's there lobbying for the retail clerk, you know, checking out the groceries. So that's what I'm saying in terms of trying to be sure that when we're looking at things um, and where we want to and make investments um, to not just um, not do it in an ad hoc way, but how does this fit into a longer term goal? Um, from my perspective, I'm hoping that we can really focus on <clears throat> how we spend the money to get that longer term benefit. Um, and I'll give you an example, broadband. Now, practically every committee has had some discussion on connectivity. Health and welfare has had it as it relates to telemedicine. Education's had it as it relates to education for kids or uh, even obviously for higher education. Um, we know from the state economists that broadband is probably the best strategy for economic development there is. So some of these areas in fact, transcend multiple committees. And how do you put together um, a response and how do you put your funding together in the most strategic way? And I think reflecting on error would suggest that that was probably not as, um, uh, as effective or people didn't think that it worked out. And some of it wasn't our fault as well. Some of it was how the federal money came down. But that's what I'm hoping that we can start thinking about is, well, what does this request fit into? How does it contribute to an agreed upon or um, articulated uh, goal, policy goal or uh, programmatic goal? Um, and um, I'll just let you know that uh, I've, it's been very difficult as chair of appropriations um, on the broadband fund, front because it is such a crucial need. Um, and we, we're all beneficiaries of comments. Public services come in with their plan. Then we're getting comments from the public. We're also getting comments from people who have a self-interest in what that outcome is. And so how do we as legislators have the independence and the expertise that we need to help us make sound decisions? So in that case, and this will tie into one of the um, appropriations requests in the budget adjustment for the legislature, is to allow us to do as we've done in other areas to hire that outside independent expertise to help us vet the comments, vet the proposals, help us think about if you've got between here and December, how do you spend that money? How do you do it in the most um, efficient way? How do you do it so it moves you forward and then incrementally? So if you had X amount, this is what you could get. This is how you want to invest it. So I just wanna let you know that that work uh, getting us that resource um, to help because all of the committees have spent hours, but how do we take a lot of that testimony and translate it into what is a sound investment and a sound plan? So um, uh, my plea to all, all, all committees is to think about um, those requests, those decisions in, in a, um, and it's connected a way as, we can, because historically it's been um, individual advocacy for something, um, and I don't need to go through. And I also think as you look at um, um, what do the trends tell us as well, and I'm very interested in um, maybe some of what we've done in the past needs to be jettisoned. Um, and that's tough because usually every area of spending's got somebody advocating for it. But um, and I'll give you an example. I don't have an opinion on it, but we've been really thinking about demographics and how we attract people to Vermont. But according to a New York Times article and what I'm hearing from some local real estate agents that in fact, all of a sudden coming to Vermont is viewed as an attractive decision and that we are seeing 
in migration or people are able to work remotely and feeling comfortable. So uh, what, is it, what are those trends? What do the data show us? In fact, maybe what we thought we needed to do to attract people, um, Mother Nature may have done <laughs> in, in a very difficult way, but mm -hmm. so that's the other thing to um, think about is, is what are those trends and how do we make investments um, that are as long-term as we can? Some are just short-term, holding things together um, but, you know, we're also concerned, we talked about it, for example, our long-term care system. And we have had a lot of focus and we've done a lot on the mental health and the, and the DS side. It's not perfect, but we, I would say that if there's anything that has not had a lot of attention, it's our long-term care and how we keep people in their communities. And so our adult days are shut down. How do we, how do we, uh, make sure that that critical component of long-term care that support people in their homes so, um, is um, continues and um, is able to provide services. So um, that's an example of looking at that long-term care system and what pieces <clears throat> are going to have to be addressed as we move out um, of where we are. So that's that's sort of um, um, my, my thinking as it relates to um, the money. So 1.2 sounds like a lot, but you start chunking it out. Um, oh, Brian, I love your cat. <laughs> What's your cat's name? Uh, I have two. That's Joe Jr. Joe Sr.'s in the other room. Joe and Joe? Joe Sr. and Joe Jr., yeah. Oh, Very oh, original. Oh. <laughs> Very, ma very imaginative, Brian. Yes, of course. I, I think um, a lot of senators seem to have cats. We've seen yes. them, you know, in the background. We have a we have a black lab around here too. Oh my gosh, you have a menagerie. Yeah. Um, a couple of other things um, that are not in the budget adjustment, but I'll throw it out here, and that is um, ANR has come in with a two million dollar request. That obviously, if we're going to get the parks up and so forth, we've got to have um, we've got to have public um, toilets and we've got to have a more aggressive public health. Um, EMS funding is another area that we know and that gets into the, uh, into the uh, frontline services and um, additional cost to higher ed. So we're in the process of uh, considering that now. Um, I know that ag has been looking at something that's quite immediate and that's um, uh, spring planting. We haven't made a decision about should that go as a separate bill. Some things are going separately. So I just want to say, you know, if we, if we um, are looking at how we move forward, we have budget adjustment, which is moving out fairly quickly, hopefully by the end of this coming week. Then we have what we're calling our quarter budget, or instead of a big bill, it's a little bill um, because we can't really build a, a full year budget with revenues as fluid and unpredictable. And then we have our joint fiscal structure that can do, excuse me, approve expenditures um, as a third wave if we have to. Um, I'll just say our priority is to use the appropriations process. The other thing um, too is trying to make sure that people, and it's hard because we're getting hit with so much information, but um, we did send out uh, sort of that simplified, this is what's happening with revenues, which was pretty simple. This is all what it adds up to. Um, and then we did have the list of all the approved expenditures that the Joint Fiscal Committee did. But if you don't have them, we can obviously get them to you. So that, um, that's where we are, um, how we do the short term with the budget adjustment, and then those longer term um, where we have a bit more time to put together thought and get the data, um, which we can do as part of uh, the 21 budget process, or we can do it um, <clears throat> if need be outside that through the joint fiscal uh, process. So I, I hope that's helpful information. So, so um, Jane, um, I just, because this is the transition group and we're talking about that and Brian and I have had some conversations in that 
a lot of what we're going to be doing is as things open up, how are we helpful in the reopening and getting back to some degree of what might be the new normal? Well, and, I, I would, okay. That's why I gave you judiciary as an example. Yep. <clears throat> they're going to start up, they're going to start up with a real built up workload. They also are using automation um, and with, which some of times has been a little controversial, but nevertheless, um, the way in which <clears throat> they do their work. So to me, that's an example of anticipating to start up what it's going to take. Um, <clears throat> where we didn't do a good job, I think, is on UI. We had a wonderful uh, plan for the uh, healthcare surge, but nothing on the UI side. So that's what I'm thinking as you're looking at um, uh, startup uh, judiciary um, is an example, but only one of, of a variety you're probably looking at. But I'm thinking, you know, helping people go back to work, helping businesses open. You know, we know that restaurants and, and the tourist business has all been shut down. A lot of what might go on is probably midsummer type things so that first quarter budget will probably have a lot of things that will deal with openings in it as it relates to the federal money. And the federal money will be able to be used for some of that, correct? Yes, and that's why I'm, I'm asking where we have the opportunities is with the federal money. So that's to me where we have um, uh, choices to be made in terms of how we um, get that right balance in terms of long-term. I'll give another, and you know, I view it as long-term investment. We know our kids, a lot of kids um, don't learn well by remote learning. They're also in homes that don't have the books. They don't have the enrichment. Some of them don't even have the internet. Um, and we're going to have kids coming back um, next fall that are we're going that will require um, remediation. So that to me is another example of how much um, would we say should be set aside um, to address those additional anticipated costs that um, uh, we will be experiencing out in the future. So that's an, an example of using the education. Um, uh, K through 12. Uh, <clears throat> in terms of business, I, um, I'm not sure what the administration is proposing. I think this is going to be difficult. And that is, how do you pick the winners and losers? Right. Who's going who's gonna to be in? Who's going to be out? And I'm particularly sensitive to that because the essential worker, which I'm chairing that committee was um, an interesting process. But uh, unless you want to give something to everybody, then it'll be very little or um, you will have to use all your 1.2 billion and you can't do anything else other than immediate relief, or you have to set criteria. And so I think the administration is gonna be coming forward with a proposal as it relates to uh, um, the business sector. Who will be included? What will be the conditions, um, et cetera? I think we'll all have to um, uh, understand better and, and either say that doesn't make sense or you know this parameter isn't right but um that's another the startup of our businesses i imagine most restaurants haven't got much food for example to start up and provide their you know until their income comes in on the other hand um i'll, I'll tell you i had a man who called me and he he um his business is <clears throat> um rentals and um housing I, rentals housing rentals yeah. And he has about 40 units. Um, he has, um, he works closely with our community action agency and housing, meeting housing needs, Department of Corrections right now. And his housing includes heat and utilities. It, about 25% of his tenants are not paying. So he's incurring the heat, he's incurring the utilities, he's foregoing revenue. He said in yesterday or two days ago, he had a call from both corrections and from community action asking for you know housing. Um, so there are um, uh, collateral impacts in terms of um, businesses that we may not think of um, as it relates to 
the, the shutdown or the um, uh, the action or de delaying sort of the eviction process. So um, th that's what we're going to have to really take a look at in terms of any proposals is um, how you want to set those parameters and the extent to which, and I, I hate using the term, but it, <clears throat> it's like essential workers. Somebody said, well, if I earn $26, that's not fair. Well, the minute you put in a parameter or you put in a criteria, somebody's going to be just a bit over, whether we're talking about housing subsidy, higher ed, you name it. Mm -hmm. And that is hard because at some point you say, this is the right balance between the resources and who's in, who qualifies and the condition. So I think those are, um, those are um, considerations that this committee is going to have to think about um, uh, when that proposal comes in. So Debbie had a question. Yeah, thank you. I, I, yeah, actually I have two questions. So um, it's very helpful, Jane, thanks. Um, but the 1.25 billion isn't the only source of federal money, right? I mean, the, the, there have been three bills so far and then there's a fourth one that they're talking about. So I'm, I imagine it must be a mammoth task to uh, to juggle, you know, all these different sources. But um, can we get some information about, um, like I know some of the healthcare expenses were covered in one bill. Uh, we health and welfare talked to the commissioner um, who talked about FEMA money for broadband, which would be separate from the 1.25 billion that she, you know she might be able to add in. Uh, is there a way for us to sort of see? All these different sources. Um. Well, <clears throat> yeah, you, we can. I can try to get it out to you. FEMA, we don't know. The FEMA, it's not as though it's a grant. It has to be, and it, it's matched. It requires a 25% match. So, from a state perspective, we want to use the COVID all federal dollars, unless, uh, and we're trying to get permission to use the um, 1.2 as. Um, a match for the FEMA, but that has yet to be determined. So uh, that, those are the kinds of financial um, examinations uh, that are going on. And also discussions around, you know, permissible use, because that, um, and uh, it's very interesting. If you want it, you say it's permissible. If you don't want somebody to use it, then you're saying, well, we don't think it is permissible. And we're kind of getting some of that as well. So um, we're, uh, Joint Fiscal is working hard to you know, talk with Treasury, to talk with other states, talk with NCSL. Um, but yes, there is additional money coming down. For example, FQHC has got about $9 million. Um, hospitals have been getting money through HRSA, uh, so we can um, provide that. Um, but, um, that. But that's within the short term. So I, my, um, and, and oftentimes it's really, um, what is it? It more prescriptive. The 1.2 gives you more flexibility within certain constraints. The big money that came in with the uh, second um, uh, co congressional bill, COVID-2, I guess you could call it, was the um, increase in the federal Medicaid match. And that frankly helped us close fiscal 20 in balance. So that um, is there. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, uh, we can get you that information if you um, want. And I, I'm surprised health and welfare has been taking so much testimony. Uh, but in terms of the money, um, um, we, can, we can get that out to you. Because some of it's gone out in grants, some of it's gone out in Medicaid loans. It, it's really complicated. So um, no. I don't know for the purposes of this committee um, how, how you want to... Um, look at that in terms of your goal from how do you transition from where where we are um that's but uh Richie, it's not that it is available yeah go yeah. ahead brian uh, i'm sorry debbie did you have a second question i did sorry oh, sorry um, so yeah just the other piece was um you know how much how much control does the legislature have over um you know like the 1.25 billion versus you know the administration um and I mean, is that sort of an ongoing discussion? Um, no, I think we resolved that with the motion that we passed and with the acceptance of the grant, um, which was a topic of discussion. How much flexibility and freedom um, do we really need? Because in fact, a lot of that one point, 
170 million had to be moved out very quickly. You know, we had to give relief to keep the uh, um, uh, retreat operational. We had to move money to Springfield. We moved money out to um, hospitals, uh, uh, to uh, providers, et cetera. So um, we, uh, in joint fiscal, we identified a certain amount that was recognized you needed to be nimble and it had to be moved and, and, um, and we understood that. The next group is um, where we're gonna try, we will appropriate. So our preference is to use the appropriations process, but there may be times, for example, if we wanna move some of that money out and it has to be spent by December 30th, it's not just obligated, it's you have to have whatever it is in hand. So it's not as though you can dump some money to a third party, so to speak. Um, and we may have to move some out through that joint fiscal process, but that will be done um, with the knowledge of all the legislators in terms of what is being proposed. So we will use the appropriations process whenever we can. That, that's our operating principle. And, the, and we articulated that when we accepted the grant at, by joint fiscal. Was it last week, Richie? Last week, the yeah. beginning of last week. Yeah. A week ago, yeah, a week ago, mo Monday, we made the first move. So I, I, my question has to do if a little bit more, I'm looking for a little more information on broadband. If mm -hmm. we keep talking about it in finance as well, you mentioned that there's a possibility of hiring uh, an organization or individual to sort of assess the situation to give us some some direction and that has that idea hasn't come up uh yet in finance so i'm just wondering if you could say a little bit more about that and well it's something that um uh, i've talked to the chair i've also had some discussion with the pro tem um to um uh because it's really an issue that unlike the house where they've got a technology committee and they're working full-time and very focused on it um uh, finance doesn't have that luxury because you've got such a broad scope of, of jurisdiction. Um, so this is something that we've, um, um, we, we haven't hired the consultant, we're in the process of doing it, but um, um, I just wanted to share that with you. Uh, and I was going to brief, actually you're uh, getting it a little ahead of uh, Senator Cummings, because uh, we're going to talk about it at our meeting at noon in terms of where we are. Right. It's something that we've done in the past, um, we did it for prison health. Yeah, um, big issues. How do you get yeah. your head around it? That kind of yeah. thing. No, it makes yeah. perfect sense. I, I'm really grateful for it. I, I was just uh, curious in terms of timing and, and do you well, have a sense, Jane? If this will this be focused on on spots where we would invest money geographically, that sort of thing, or it? Um, I'm not. I don't think we're that prescriptive. Okay. I think we'll take the data, we'll look at where we have uh, significant issues, we'll look at what we have in structures in place. We have those CUDs that are now up yeah. in certain areas. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, they can help us look at that public service uh, uh, proposal, Yeah. Um, which either some people say is good and other people, you, you know, the in, um, from comments uh, have been critical. I'm not in a position to evaluate the merits of either argument. Um, we've had responses from providers. Um, and so they're uh, having someone with that understanding of the background in terms of, of who, who um, it's sort of, if you're, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu, so to speak. And um, so many people are there, you know, uh, representing their best interests but that may not be what's in our overall best interest. So it helps us get that independent examination of either validating the report uh, and the proposal or where it needs to be expanded, um, where you would be the most strategic, where you could move the money out quickly and in the best way, uh, because it's got to be spent by December 30th. So yeah. that's, um, we would, that resource would be available to committees what I'm saying to finance um, to help give that kind of comment back. Um, and it is crucial for any of us who are 
deciding where money's to be spent. We need to have some confidence um, that, that um, this is the best use and the most effective direction um, for anything that gets appropriated. Okay, thanks. Ruth. Yeah, thank you. And thanks, Jane, this is helpful. Um, I, I just wanted to make sure I understood the consultant person that your people that you're talking about. Are, is it specific to the broadband issue or is it broader than that? Right now it's gonna be broadband. Okay. Although, uh, uh, but we have asked because I'm sitting um, <clears throat> with two other related issues. One is public access television. And there's a, a bill that came over from finance for 100,000 to study because the committee last summer couldn't come up with anything. Um, and then um, the other is the need for a 10 year telecommunications plan. So <clears throat> um, that is from my perspective, um, the, the challenges have come in separately. Right. But should we be looking at um, those needs um, as part of a package and how to proceed? So um, those are two other, in my mind, related where we have a separate bills um, and, um, and I'm like, gee, sh should in fact, when we're looking at connectivity or we're looking at, um, for example, public access is saying they've been doing a lot with education to support yes. public education. Um, so where does that fit in? And so I think from my perspective, we excuse me, could get um, some help in terms of how they fit in or where they fit in or how they can be financed or do we look at them um, as um, as components, so to speak of. Uh, right, that makes uh, sense. So it's brought, it's, te it's uh, technology, broadly speaking, the big network technology. Um, mm -hmm. And you're right about public access. They have been doing a lot with schools as has pu public television. Um, they have a whole, program yeah. that they've been using for remote education. So that might be something to consider in that package, but that's good to hear. My, my other question as um, I'm thinking about the education area is, would it be helpful or appropriate uh, for us to have, you know, as we come up with things that are gonna need to be addressed in the transition that we try to come up with a dollar amount that we think makes sense or, would you prefer that we just tell you this is an issue that needs to be dealt with and you pick a dollar amount? What, what, how do you want to come up with the, what is, what do you see our role is in trying to figure out how much money to try to allocate to each issue? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I, I do. And that's going to be the challenge because sometimes it's better to say what you Think would be the desirable and then we we move down based on what we have for spending so yeah. I, I would think um agency of education is going to be critical to say look this is our estimate out of the universe of kids we think this percentage overall you're going to have it the distribution obviously will be different from region to region um is what um uh what we estimate those additional costs will be to um do the educational remediation and um what other uh, needs. So I, I think putting an estimate um, for different options is, is helpful. Okay. It doesn't Great. guarantee anything, but Great. it also gives you some perspective of, well, do we want to obligate half of our CRF for this particular initiative? And so it gives you some sense of, of sort of proportionality as well. Mm -hmm. And another question in education that came up yesterday, actually, in the Senate Education Committee, that I've been mulling a lot is um, where we were talking about school construction as there's a bill in the house that, you know, was pre COVID. So it's, we're talking about how we can change it to, uh, to address emergency facility needs in schools. And one of the big issues is uh, ventilation systems. If we have school buildings filled with kids that don't have good ventilation. That's just a breeding ground for transmitting the virus. Um, so we were thinking about trying to identify these emergency areas where a school ventilation system should probably be replaced this summer before kids get back in the building and teachers get back in the building. And I'm wondering in terms of timing, is that, do you feel like that kind of thing, if we determine that's a 
priority for the legislature is possible in terms of timing. Yeah, it, pro it would be. Um, the question is what um, mechanism we use. As I said, um, once uh, we pass the BAA, we're down to the um, little bill or through, um, through the joint fiscal re approval process. Okay. But I don't have an idea, you know, I mean, when you think about <laughs> um, the estimates on the lead, that was excruciating to come up with those figures. Um, right, and we haven't even started to do that research. It just came up yesterday and I've been thinking mm -hmm. about it overnight, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, so that that would be, um, um, I, I would think that that would be a permissive, the same as the modifications to our courthouses to provide a level of safety to the public and to jurors and staff. Yeah, we thought it was related um, mm -hmm. given that the ventilation is a big issue with the transmission of the disease, so. And the other thing that um, we have some discretion on too, if, if something could be done through FEMA, in other words, this and this is yet to be determined, if in fact the needs exceed the 1.25, so we use FEMA money um, in addition, um, which of these um, uh, needs, in fact, could be funded through that uh, revenue? But that's, you know, that's the kind of stuff we do routinely uh, when we're looking at available funding. So I don't know if school, um, if whether that would qualify under FEMA or not. It might. I, I'm not sure. But um, those are the kinds of things we'll have to say. Gee, our in first intent was to use CRF, but because uh, we've obligated it, we're going to move these allowable costs over to the FEMA bucket. Um, th those are those are yet to be determined, and we're writing everything uh, out to give us the flexibility to do those kinds of, uh, um, you know, um, reallocations. Uh, anything um, else? I yeah. don't, is it, is Alice, do you have something, or Anthony? Just on that last uh, piece we discussed here. I saw in Germany, in the New York Times, a picture of a school, all the interior doors open, the outside windows open, and they told people, wear sweaters and coats because it's going to be a little chilly in here. <laughs> the ventilation. Oh. Yeah, I think that's a real issue. It, it, the, the circulation of air and the sharing of, you know, droplets. <laughs> I know, and and probably to some extent, you could blow through every bit of money just on these um, uh, modifications. So that gets into um, um, that debate around how you want to allocate and what needs and at what level. Um, some of it, of course, you can um, they, they modifications. To, sometimes, if it's not a lot, sometimes schools have reserves. Sometimes they will just bond for it as part of their budget. So a lot depends on the school. Um, anything so, else? Anthony, did you have something? Not really, just a very sobering way to start the day. No, oh. so, so let me just uh, do a little. So um, the, the place we should look for transition is mostly around the federal money. And there'll probably be, um, uh, either work with the um, joint fiscal committee or the first quarter um, budget that comes out um, is an area that we might be able to be helpful. What I would say to you and Anne in those is I hear there's, because I know we don't want to do anything that a standing committee is going to do in this committee, but if there's room um, in um, around issues like broadband that Anne and um, in um, appropriations would like help, I think. And I heard some discussion about the administration may have a big business proposal coming out. If we can be helpful in vetting those, let us know. You know, the one thing that I would say um, as we move down this road, and all I can think of is John Muir, everything is hitched to everything else. And so much of what we're talking about transcend multiple committees. Yep. And usually in so many cases, the ultimate stop is, uh, uh, as I say, the corner suite, because that's where the money um, has to be decided on. But um, think about 
uh, these issues because the committees of you may have multiple areas of uh, jurisdiction at some point some entity has to bring that together and it seems to me maybe that that's what um, uh, your committee is designed to do is to take those um, disparate pieces or discussions that are occurring in multiple places and thinking about how you put them together um, and as you uh, make recommendations. Well, what I would say is if we can be helpful in that process and you in and in, in the money committees see us, see a role for us, let us know. Well, don't worry, you're on the money committee as is Alice. I understand that, but I think in the over, and as I listen to you on the broadband piece, um, I think there is a role that we could play um, in that broadband piece if, um, 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 if it makes sense, because finance is so busy, I don't think they can cover it all. Well, Mike, um, and I guess the other thing that happens too is that um, in the course of committee work, you take testimony, but at some point you've got to translate that into action um, and um, what that should look like. And it's going to look like, you know, I mean, it's going to be every discussion is going to be a little different focus, but at some point you have to put it together. And so broadband is an example, as I said, or connect connectivity is really is an example. It probably transcends every committee. Yep. So, um, and people are, every committee is looking at it from their perspective, whether it's the telemedicine, for example, or remote learning for kids to economic development, et cetera. So just because it doesn't fit neatly, you know, um, we've got to, we, we've got to start thinking beyond the, and it's, it's difficult because committee jurisdiction is a precious thing and you, you can't have it all disorganized, but at some point you have to bring it um, together. That's why I, I like appropriations because I, that's where I can see it coming together or try to bring it together. But um, when you're developing policy, um, think, about, think about how you do it with these multiple committees involvement in discussion and how to take that testimony and translate it into some recommendations for action. Anthony, you are? No, I'm good. Oh, good, good. You have a beautiful plan. Is that a geranium in the back there? Yep. Oh. oh. Actually, most of the plants went outside this morning. Otherwise, there'd be a lot more in here. Oh. But it's finally warmed up. It's rainy, but it's going to be like close to 70 degrees today. I know, I know. My son, drove, when he drove in last night, he called. He said, I can't believe there's snow on the backside of my house. <laughs> yeah. So, um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm ready for the 70 degree. Um, so, um, and you've got two members of your committee um, on um, appropriations, Brian, you've got someone on um, finance. So uh, I think you can, between the health and welfare and um, ag and ed, um, seems like you've got really good connecting points. Um, I, that's one advantage I think we have in the Senate is the smallness and being on multiple committees um, kind of brings information um, together um, pretty efficiently. Great. Thank you so much. This has been very helpful. I don't think, anybody else have anything else before we all run to our 8.30s? What a way to start the day. <laughs> very helpful. I just have one comment, I, um, and it's more of a question for Brian and Richie, but, um, uh, if there are areas, just in listening to Jane, I was thinking of other areas that we may not have covered. Um, for example, uh, libraries, uh, which is covered in the education committee. And, and I, I haven't really checked in too much with libraries, but wondering if I should add them into my list um, just to see what the impact has been. They've mostly been closed, but, and then another that I've already, that I early on uh, put on Jane's list is arts organizations. They've been really devastated because they had to close so early in this and will not be able to reopen for a really long time. And that is such a part of our tourism and cultural life here, especially in a lot of small towns. Um, and, 
and obviously Burlington, but um, just wanting to make sure we don't forget about them. And I didn't, I don't remember if they were on anybody's list. I think, um, I think Monday um, morning when at 7.30, when we go, um, um, when we fill out that list, look at what Luke sent out and, 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 and um, we're gonna hone that list down more, so. So I, I guess I encourage you think long term and short term. I mean, sometimes you get so wrapped up with the immediacy right now, but um, I think we've got some opportunities here, and we need to keep our eye on the you know the long term. Thanks. And Thanks thank, for you. Having thank me. you very much. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Jane. Thanks, everybody. You're thank awesome. You Monday. If Bye -bye. you have any questions or whatever, you know. Um, please, or if you think, uh, I've tried to get information, but if there's something you need, just shoot me an email and we'll try to get it to you. Great. Thank I you could so. cut off my head and send it out. <laughs> <laughs> but then you'd find it's an empty vessel and then you would be very disappointed. It would be like the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> oh. I don't think so. No. Um, the other- okay. Thanks. You guys should Bye. See you later. Bye. Hi, Jane. It, it, as soon as I hear information back from the administration about putting together um, some a, a transition presentation from them, um, we'll get that information right out to you. And I'm hoping that that's Tuesday. Okay, good. And Richie, since uh, we're, what I'm sure you've heard a lot of concerns from early childhood um, child yep. care community, and is that going to be covered? You know what. What I'm going it, that in the conversations. Um, every time I've talked to them, I said we need to talk about you know the childcare piece, and you need to have somebody from DCF there. Yeah. Okay. Because you know, two weeks before they're supposed to open, and they just are freaking out, and rightly uh, so. <laughs> well, you got you got. Um, I, I forwarded the email, and and I haven't got an adequate response back from that yet. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks, okay. everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Rich.